Rachel and Helen, welcome to the Science of Psychotherapy podcast. It's so good to see you both. Nice to see you. Yeah, thank you for having us. Uh, Great pleasure. And Richard here uh, as well, just uh, really enjoying the the opportunity to to speak to you guys. Uh, Now now you're in America. Uh, You're on different sides of the coast, so you can't uh, uh, see each other. But but now we get this great opportunity to bring you together Mm -hmm. in some ways. And you've written this amazing book, and we've talked about that in our introduction. But and we've said a few things about you, but perhaps, you know, can you sort of tell us a bit more about what brought you together, a little bit about the, that sort of history and, and what generated this wonderful book? Um, Rachel and I met actually several years ago when we were working at the Bay Area Discovery Museum. So I'm a developmental psychologist, have done a lot of research on both cognitive and social emotional learning, um, specifically language development in young children. And I joined the uh, Bay Area Discovery Museum, which is a beautiful museum in Sausalito, California. So for those of you who are in the U.S. or come to visit the U.S., it's, it's a spectacular place, which, which has one of the most gorgeous views of the Golden Gate Bridge that you will find anywhere. So, But it's also a wonderful place for families with young children um, to discover and explore. And I joined the museum as the research director of a center called the Center for Childhood Creativity. And that's where I met Rachel. And she is the head of, was the head of school of the preschool at the museum. So another unique thing about the museum is that it has an on-site preschool. So these preschoolers get full range of the museum. um, And so it's quite a special place. And I'll, I'll turn it over to Rachel from there to tell a little bit more about the museum and how we met. My background is I actually lived overseas for a very long time. I was almost 25 years in Asia, in China in particular. Um, And I got a call one day while I was in in China, in Beijing, actually, from the head of the Bay Area Discovery Museum, and they were looking to start this preschool. And they were interested in having someone who came They were just seeking some advice from me. I was an educator and I had been instrumental in starting a museum in New York City long ago, a children's museum in New York City long ago. So I gave them a little bit of advice and we were talking and they said, would you like this job? (laughs) And I thought, oh my God, yes, I would really like this job. So literally in like three months, we packed up everything and moved to California. And I met Helen and we were tasked with starting this school um, that was going to be a lab school. And we were taking Helen's research and putting her research into an applied practice in this alternative, amazing space that Helen mentioned. And Helen and I, I just, we immediately hit it off and um, we just really spent a long time talking about child development and human development and what the questions that parents were asking and their struggles. And also we spent a lot of time thinking about how to get children to think about the thinking of each other at the stages where children are developing the ability to think about another person's thinking. In fact, it was even with the preschool ages, we were really trying to plant these seeds that you are a separate person. And let's start thinking about what the other person next to you is doing. And would that impact then your choices? Would it make you more compassionate? Would it make you more empathic? And so, and we just, really enjoyed the work we were doing together. And I said to Helen, you know, let's write a book. And she was like, oh, definitely, let's do that. And so that's how it came to be. Fantastic. What amazing backgrounds you both have. Yeah. (laughs) So when it comes to um, the emotional development of the child, did you did you perceive a, a deficit in the kids you were working with and you needed to work with them or you were just looking at the natural trajectory and you just wanted to inform parents and educators? What was the sort of the, what were you perceiving? I mean, I, I can answer that if you'd like, Helen. Um, we were not seeing any sort of deficit with the children. What we were seeing was 
um, I would say parents may be expecting a little bit more from right. their children. And again, this was pre-pandemic. So we weren't, we were seeing sort of general behavior that we were used to seeing in our research. And, you know, there's been a little bit of a shift, I would say, just, you know, post-pandemic, but it was more that when parents had very high expectations for what their child could do, mm. then they might get a little bit frustrated with their child, which would cause their child to to not understand you know, why someone is responding this way. And there, the way that they would react and respond to their child, I mean, to their parent would be, would appear as if they had behavioral issues. Right, right. And that expectation is that, uh, is that a new thing? Uh, are parents ha having higher expectations or has it always been like that? I think that another thing, another way to look at this is, you know, it's human nature to sort of compare right? Mm -hmm. So you see another child in your child's classroom or on the playground that looks around the same age and they're doing X, right? And your child's not yet or something like that, right? And so I don't think it's a new thing. I mean, Rachel definitely has more experience of this as a classroom teacher and, and just working closely with families and children. But, um, you know, something that I've observed as a parent and, and as a practitioner and a researcher is that, again, it's just, it's human nature to, you know, to look at your child and be like, wait, why, why are all these other kids doing this and mine's not, or mine's doing it differently, right? But then what we try and get across in the book is really to understand, you know, this sort of beautiful trajectory of human development, but it's very individual, right? And so what we try not to do in the book is say at age X, your child should be doing this, right? We talk about different stages of development because there are, there is definitely, you know, a stage and an, and an order to it, but there's so much range in terms of when individual children are going to be, you know, having certain language development milestones or, or whatever it is in their development. So that's something that we also, you know, really try and get across in the book. Yeah, this is this is such an important thing that I've been uh, sort of banging on about for a long time. The the nature of the external expectations, as different as, uh, from internal and and self capacities and and development. And and I had the the good fortune to just happen onto a replay of the film My Left Foot, which is um, uh, Daniel Day Lewis won his Oscar for that. Where severely uh, uh, palsy, cerebral palsy, disabled, unable to function. The only thing they could function successfully was his his left foot, and there was all this drama going on and uh, terribly poor communities and things. But and at one stage, the, the the scene was he was on the floor and he grabbed a piece of chalk in his in his foot and he wrote on the ground, um, uh, and the, the the word came out mother. And his father, who was a terribly rough and gruff and, and, and man who was trying to get his people through poverty, picked up the child and said, and, she, and the mother said, and where are you taking him? He said, he's going down to the pub. Uh, so I took him off and he walked into the pub with the child on his shoulder, you know, sort of all down there and said, okay, everybody, this is my son, Michael, and he is a genius. <laughs> And I thought, how wonderful that the father, who you would have thought was, you know, very, very poor in, 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 some, in his assessments, was totally valuing what the child was doing, regardless of what the world thought. And this is, this is testing in a very, very competitive market of which certainly the West uh, has, uh, has made a big deal. This, this sort of uh, framework... Um, I don't know whether to ask a question or just whether just on those what thoughts come up as I as I put that forward. Absolutely. And I think the interesting thing from your story, it sounds to me what was happening is that the parent stopped looking at the child as if the child had to be something different mm -hmm. and just observed what his son was doing and noticed his son for who he was. And then that it's that rush of emotion of like, this, this person is okay. And I'm okay. When we just stop looking through that veil of expectation and we just start observing from that place of what's happening around me, you know, what is my child doing? 
can I, and, and one thing we emphasize a lot in the book is just ask and don't tell. Don't tell yourself, you know, how things are supposed to be. Don't tell your child how things are supposed to be, but really just start to ask yourself, what's happening here? What's happening within me when I'm watching my child interact? You know, notice even if you start to compare your child to others and just sort of observe that with an open and non judgmental place. And then then ask your child, if your child is at that age, to be able to talk as well and to answer questions, just ask them what they're doing mm. and what, what inspired them and what gave them that idea. And even you can tune into and ask your child, like, what are the physical feelings that you're having when you're experiencing this? Is there a contraction? Is there a tension? You know, children like to talk about these things. They're very very, they, they like to be noticed. They want to be felt. They want to be heard. They want to be understood and felt it in, in that sense of just like, see me, hear me, accept me. Yeah. Yeah. At a very young age, they notice that. Yeah. Helen, what are you thinking? Yeah, no, I just, I wanted to build on a point that, that Rachel just made about um, linking, you know, our emotions and, and the, the physical feeling that you have. So something that we talk about in the book is that, like Rachel said, children are very love to express like, well, when you're angry, how does that make you feel? Does it make you feel hot? Right? Do you feel tense? And so we try and really explain a lot of that in the book as to how parents can, you know, ask their child, you know, how are you feeling? Sometimes children will have the words to explain it and, and or the exact word, the emotion word right? Whether it's angry or fearful or scared or sad, um, but sometimes they won't. And so sometimes they can explain it better of like, well, what do you, you know, what are you feeling physically, right? Do you have a tingly feeling? Do you have a, you know, is it, do you feel light? Do you feel heavy? And so, you know, just trying to, again, ask your child how they're feeling, but ask them in different ways, because, you know, for, especially for young children, they might not have the exact words, but they are usually pretty good at expressing like, how they're feeling physically, right? And so um, that's something that I think is really important and that, you know, parents can start to do, um, you know, because it can be a frustrating experience if you're asking your child how they feel and they're like, uh, you know, they can't, they, they don't have the words yet, right? So mm, giving yeah. them strategies and tools for expressing it in a different way. Would it be fair to say, because very young children don't have the words, you know, they could draw it maybe more effectively, you know, or, or, or some other medium. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And that's something else we also mentioned in the book, draw, like drawing with your child or asking your child to draw using puppets, using lots of different play, you know, playing with your child, right? Lots of times, maybe they don't have the words to express something, but just through their play, they're going to express that. And then you could see that it's sort of a safe, it's a safe place for them when they're, when they're playing. It's, it's interesting. We've been fortunate to have some uh, lovely conversations with Joseph Ledoux, who has done all the amazing work, uh, particularly with, with the amygdala and uh, the fear response. And he apologises profusely nowadays. He says, oh, look, I'm terribly sorry uh, because uh, I gave this idea that the amygdala was the seat of fear. He said, no, the fear is an emotion, is something that is a felt experience that the self understands. And I think this is what's so beautiful about what you're saying in encompassing that is those words, the experiences, the, 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 the self-knowledge, because it's certainly in the subtitle of your book, building a self-awareness. So as they build their self-knowledge, maybe they'll get the words, but the, the behavioral aspects and those, those some sensorial uh, expressions that the body gives. There's so many messages. We don't have to get this erudite, you know, five-year-old to say, well, I'm actually feeling a little bit this and a little. It, they do it so much more. And the way you describe that uh, in the book, I think, it, it, well, fundamentally, I found it very comforting. Uh, I, I just thought it was sort of like a sigh of relief. And, and this is something that you seem to do through the book, giving these different ways of approaching uh, the way uh, uh, a communication with with the child how did you how did you work through those things I imagine your experience uh, with kids for so long was, was was very important in that definitely the experience with kids and um, 
And, and of course, reading the research and really figuring out how to apply it. Mm-hmm. And, you know, what Helen said is that kids love to play and they love to have fun. And kids sort of turn away if it just seems like I've done this before, this isn't interesting. So always trying to develop strategies to get kids to be more self-aware in fun ways. And that is definitely, you know, and to get them talking. So Helen even mentioned um, we use puppets a lot. So if we want to, let's say, build the language of emotions, we could just stick a puppet on our hand and talk to the puppet about how the puppet is feeling. And the puppet can talk back, building that emotional, the the vocabulary needed for emotional language. And children are completely absorbed by that. And then the puppet can then talk to the child so that, you know, they're going to have a, you know, like this, this puppet is talking to me and they're going to answer with enthusiasm and excitement. And they might even mimic or parrot or use some of that emotional language that they've heard and just learned from me talking with the puppet or from Helen talking with the puppet. Yeah. One of the things I wanted to ask is, um, obviously, you know, parents and teachers, absolute pivotal role in the emotional development of the child. But what about kids with their peers and their playing with peers? And I'm just interested to know how, just how critical that is in emotional development, because we have some kids that they might be out in the country, they might be homeschooled, they might be fairly isolated. There might be other, and there's other kids, obviously, that are in, you know, large classrooms mixing with kids all the time. And I'm just wondering about this aspect of peer to peer um, emotional development. Peers are huge. Um, it, you know, they have a huge influence and impact on children as, from a very young age. And so there's lots of research showing in um, various areas, whether it's executive function or language development and communication, that that peer relationship and just children watch other children right? And they learn from them. Sometimes this is good. Sometimes it's not so good, right? But that's that's who they they sort of glom onto, right? Like, yes, they learn a lot by watching adults and important, you know, caretakers and parents and so forth, but they really tune in to what other children are doing, right? And they learn a lot of language from children. Again, sometimes good, sometimes not so good. Um, but that is a huge influence on children's learning. And so just having that um, you know, peer to peer interactions. Um, there's yeah, just tons of research showing that that's hugely beneficial, whether it's a sibling or a similar age peer or an older peer or sibling. Um, but yes, that's and it has a huge impact on their social emotional learning as well in terms of perspective taking, in terms of self awareness. Um, but yeah, I'll let I'll let Rachel continue more from a you know practitioner point of view and what she's observed, and I'm sure many many of her classrooms. Children are being influenced by each other all the time. And so when we, and what's something that we do in an applied practice to that is that we remind children that people have different emotional approaches to things. They have different ways that they solve problems, different ways that they talk to one another, um, different ways that they'll react when they feel frustrated. And so we, we talk a lot about this idea of noticing your emotional approach and noticing the emotional approaches of others. And we don't say there's a right or wrong. We just say it's a it's an approach to what we do and how we respond to things. And we say, you know, there are some things that we remind children to pay attention to. So we say, you know, re- when you enter a space, before you do anything, check in with yourself and then observe what the people around you are doing. What are the other children doing? Because a lot of times kids will just enter a space and they'll enter yeah. someone else's activity mm. without, you know, it's just like, here I am. There you are. I'm here. <laughs> I'm going to play with your truck. And it's like, whoa, you know, don't come near my truck. I'm, you know, I'm having a great time pretending that I'm a farmer. And now you've just entered my play space and you want to do something else. So yeah. we remind children, pause and observe, look at what people are doing. Something else we, we talk to them a lot about is check into what you do when things don't go your way, which is like, 
kids are like, wait, what? <laughs> you, know, you know, like I, something happens to me. And things, you know, we sort of say, stop, pull back. And when you feel that tension, pause and ask yourself, what am I going to do? Something's not going the way that I anticipated. So we, we remind kids to do that. We always tell them your body is going to send you some messages. Stay, stay tuned, stay aware of those messages. We also remind them that everybody around them not only has spoken language that they're using to communicate something, but they also have messages that they're sending without words, which is also really surprising for a kid. Like, wait, what? <laughs> so that you can tell me something without, you know, without actually saying something. So we teach them to look at body language. And we also ask them, we teach them about their mood, which is surprising. You know, we wouldn't think that a child could be aware of their mood, but we can say, you have a mood and it's constantly changing. So ask yourself, wh what is my mood right now? Because when a child can identify their mood at that moment, they then can start to see how they approach others. And so, you know, there's this sort of cyclical thing, like, you know, um, then they can, once they know their mood, they can see, oh, this is how I responded. To. And these are very sophisticated, self-aware, you know, um, this is sophisticated self-awareness. But when you teach it in a fun and creative way, a child understands this and will right. start really use this information and apply it. Yeah, I know a lot of adults still need to learn some of that self-awareness. <laughs> Absolutely. But, there, but there's been some very interesting animated uh, films in the last few years that have that have addressed this type of issue when we've had, uh, and I know my little five-year-old uh, granddaughter uh, really adores some of these, and and she's um, uh, engaged with the uh, with the, with the language the films have, have put forward, and some of, and particularly just the the the, the images and the pictures and uh, and so on and so forth. And she's beginning to be able to see this in some of then the other stories. Uh, and you can say, oh, how's Aladdin feeling at this time? Is it, oh, Aladdin's not terribly happy about it. And we're able to get this, so this conversation of, of um, uh, as you say, this, this awareness, self-awareness, but it's also other awareness too uh, I'm beginning, I'm seeing with, uh, with my granddaughter. This, um, and this as a strategy, what's the recommendations? Because the other part, sort of second part under, underlying this question is I guess I'm talking about my five-year-old uh, granddaughter, but the ideas you're talking about cover a long time. And then as Matt said, hey, there's some teachers, uh, adults who could, um, who could read this and learn a bit as well. What's your thoughts about the age groups and the different applications uh, the, of the way you, you can utilize the strategies in your book? You know, as, as you as you were talking, Richard, and and about your wonderful granddaughter in, in different films, and like, I mean, the film like Inside Out comes to yeah. right, yeah. like that would definitely, and we we actually mentioned that in our book, I think, in our, in our conclusion, in our in our last chapter. Um, but the different ways we talk about, you know, different stages and ages. I'll just take um, in chapter one, we talk about this area of research called theory of mind, right? Which is really about understanding our own mental states, which include our feelings, our thoughts, our beliefs, our intentions, right? And those of others, right? As, as I think Rachel mentioned earlier, a really critical piece of that is children understanding that they have their own mental states, right? That, that, that drive their behaviors and the person sitting next to them has their own, right? Sometimes they might be the same, right? They might like both like chocolate ice cream, um, you know, maybe they're different. And, and so in the theory of mind um, chapter, what we really try and get across is there's huge development that happens between infancy age and we go sort of up through age eight-ish, like early grade school years. And tremendous growth and development happens during that time from children, just infants wanting to have a social connection with another person, right? So an adult smiles at an infant, they'll smile back, right? And they love that back and forth interaction. And then as early as like around age two or even a little earlier, you know, toddlers are beginning to understand something about desires, about I might like something, but this other person might not. Right. And then they they would give if, if that other person requests something and they know what that other person likes. Right. Like we use this really classic 
I, I believe really clever study called the broccoli goldfish study, right? If the toddler sees someone express disgust at the goldfish crackers, but you know, that they happen to like broccoli, which who would ever do that? But, <laughs> and, and that person asks the child and these kids are under two years old, you know, to give me some kids as young as 18 months are going to give them the broccoli because that's what they said they liked, right? Mm -hmm. Even though the child themselves most likely likes goldfish, right? So these incredible developments are happening very early on. And so I think that's another thing, sort of theme we have throughout the book, not only for theory of mind, but also for language development and executive function. Lots of these important developments are happening so early. And so for parents to know about them um, is really important because that's when they can have a really important you know, influence um, or impact on, on these developments. Absolutely. Mm. Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm certainly, I'm watching uh, Stevie uh, now. Uh, she's just coming up five and you can see it. I mean, it's, uh, if you know, if you know what you're looking for. And, and I just wish I knew what I knew now when my kids, mm. you know, when I was a dad, I, I, uh, I, I love grandfather stuff. You get a second go, but um, yeah, but really important. Yeah, exactly. A ditto here, you know, uh, having, if, if I had, you know, my time again, uh, like you guys were saying, you know, uh, ask, don't tell. Mm. I did a lot more telling than asking, I tell you. Oh, yeah, that's so good. I love that. I've written that down uh, <laughs> just to remind myself, yeah. Yeah. Um, so in terms of the the um, target for the book, you, you've written um, for which population? You Parents or therapists or both? Tell us a little a bit about who you've been writing to. Helen and I have discussed this at length. I think it would be a great book for, for sure it's for parents, a parenting book, but it would be a great book for teachers and educators, preschool teachers, anyone working with young children. It's very useful for therapists as well, because if you are working with families and you know, you're, and there or even couples and they have young children and some of the frustration could be around different parenting styles, it, it would be very helpful for a therapist to understand this development. Yeah, I, I, I see that too, uh, uh, Matt. You know, and this is why we, we wanted to have you on on the show. What, what are you thinking there, Matt? Oh, yeah. So I was just going to say my impression is um, it, it, a great resource for the therapist to, to have read and then as a resource then to give to, you know, parents and, and families you know, that they're, um, they're counselling. Yeah, I, I see it used both ways. You know, the, the, the mm. therapist learning for themselves. Yes. But then also being able to, to counsel the, uh, the, the parents. Um, but even more so to also to give the therapist a deeper uh, understanding of what's going on inside the child. I mean, I think for me, one of one of my favourite chapters in the book is the one on executive function. I think mm. that we'll yeah. hear that theme a lot. Right. And then they may not quite understand what it means. So we, we really tried hard to sort of break it down and how it relates to social emotional development. So executive function being sort of this suite of skills in terms of focus of attention um, and cognitive flexibility and working memory and all those definitely being skills that are important in a classroom sort of setting or more academic and learning setting. Right. Because if the kids can't focus and pay attention, they're not going to learn. They're not going to learn anything. Right. But also we try and talk about it more from a social emotional perspective. You also need those skills to take turns, to engage in a conversation, right, to interact successfully with another person. Right. If we can't inhibit some of our impulses, even as adults. Right. We're not going to have very successful relationships or conversations with people. And so I think that's one that, you know, that's one of my favorite things about the book is really trying to break down this concept of executive function you know, telling, you know, explaining to parents why these skills are so critical, often called, you know, learning to learn skills, really these foundational skills that have been shown in lots of research to be very powerful predictor, predictors of children's success um, in school and, and in work and in life, basically. And then talking about them more from a social emotional perspective and how, um, and how to build those skills. So we talk a lot about um, teaching children skills for planning and reflecting, for example, as ways to boost your child's executive function. I would also add, just back to that question about therapists, too, and how they could use the book. Um, we do offer the mind framework, which is the whole second part of the book. And the mind framework basically 
The M stands for mindfulness. The I is for inquiry. The N is for non-judgment. And the D is for decide. And so we offer sort of, we don't say that there's a, a, a hierarchy that you have to use the M first and then the, the I, you know, you don't have to follow that order, but these keep in your back pocket, this mind framework. You know, I always tell parents that I work with, take your phone, take your keys, and take the mind framework, and put it in your pocket. Um, and, and those, those four points, and we explain them very clearly um, how to apply that this framework to think about your own parenting and to how you react and respond to your child. And it's very useful. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Rachel and Helen, for the, the work that you've put into, you know, bringing all of this information to us in your book, The Emotionally Intelligent Child. As always, we will leave a link in the show notes so everyone can seek it out. Uh, but it's been great uh, catching up with you guys and uh, finding out a little bit about you. And uh, we wish you all the very best with your book. Thank you so much. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Uh, yes, it's, it's our great... Yes, it's our great pleasure to because this is really a, a fine contribution to uh, the what will be what we need to find in a, in a better functioning engagement and this interpersonal idea uh, and it's there we've kind of forgotten it and it's wonderful that you bring it back and then add the add the knowledge base that new knowledge base to it the science the, it's a wonderful wonderful contribution thank you thank you so much thank you thanks.